So welcome to this fourth lecture of the Knowledge and Data course of the fifth module, namely uh, the module about data and knowledge integration. And uh, we've now come to the point where we can really look at the data integration in, in more detail. And in principle, this is one of the lectures where, where you hopefully see that everything that you've learned over the past four or five weeks comes together and that you can now really start building cool web applications with uh, data that comes from various sources and that has been combined with explicit knowledge. So I hope you see after this and the next lecture why you have been working on this stuff for the past uh, three weeks. So data integration is really about taking two different things, data sets that have been used for different purposes and integrate them into one thing for your specific application in, in this case, but uh, sometimes it's also about building new data sources and so forth. And uh, how do we do this? So we, the goal is that we want to have some data access to existing data sources and maybe our own data sources. We integrate them and we reason over them. And some of the integration is done via reasoning. And this is basically using integrated knowledge. Basically, this integrated knowledge we then use for data publishing on a website or as a web service. So this is the, the, the overall picture. And let's see how this now works in practice. We take something like DBpedia, which is already in RDF. We have maybe some Sparkle endpoints that we can query. We might have some data that comes as CSVs, so com comma separated files. So there are many, many different versions of data uh, access on the web. And um, we look at uh, two examples later. Uh, we put this data all in our own Stardock repository and we integrate it and get some accessible uh, database to which we can ask Sparkle queries. So that sounds relatively easy and is not very difficult. And you have already done this a little bit in uh, lecture three, I believe, in, in week three, in the module three. So let's see look at the first step, namely, how do we get access to these different uh, data sources that are on the web? And uh, as you might have already noticed, many of them come in forms of um, CSV data. So if you look at the, uh, the, the repositories of data that uh, we also link to, open data and so forth, most of it really comes in table form and relational databases. And then obviously people ask themselves, can we speed up the process of translating these data tables into RDF? And yes, there has been a lot of work done in the W3C, the World Wide Web Standardization Consortium, to come up with generic ways of transforming tabular data into RDF. Uh, remember, well, this is also something you did in the beginning, so in the, first, uh, in the second week, I believe, and um, as you remember, this is non-trivial, not trivial, because you have many choices and uh, you all came up with your own models. Uh, and, and this is very important moment to decide on how you, you see the data that you want to work with. So this is the kind of situation you have. You have a data table with some name, the age, the occupation and the sex. And now you want to use this information and turn this into RDF, into a knowledge graph, so that you can integrate it with other knowledge graphs and that you can uh, reuse this in your application. The first way to do this is, a, is what's called a direct mapping of relational data. And uh, I recommend you follow this link. It, is, uh, it describes how this is done. Uh, let me click on it and see uh, and show you what, how this works. So there is a, is a direct mapping algebra, which you can directly apply. So if you get a certain uh, table, how do you do this following some rules? What is the function of, of foreign keys and so forth? So this is basically the same type of rules that you have thought of in your first assignment. Uh, and here it's systematically written down how to do this properly. There are, on the other hand, also some tools that you can use. So there is a mapping language, RDP to RDF, a mapping language, um, which really gives you conversions of RDB to uh, RDF. Um, there is a metadata vocabulary for tabular data, which instructs you to, um, to convert CSV. So not a, not a proper database, but only the comma separated versions of RDF. 
and um, there is even a vocabulary that is used to describe the tables themselves, which is uh, the data cube vocabulary, but that is probably out of the scope. So if you want to transform CSV data, it's really useful to look at this description. How do you get, how do you get from tabular metadata to uh, uh, your own data sets um, so that you can, can transform these CSV files into your RDF knowledge graphs? Another thing you can do is to use a, a framework such as OpenRefine. And uh, if you go to the OpenRefine website, there is a lot of material uh, that you can, can, uh, can use. There is also a link to, um, to uh, screencasts that explain the OpenRefine uh, framework. And there are also two links on the, open, uh, on the course website that um, uh, show you how to translate uh, messy data into RDF. And I think that is very useful to look into if you have data sources that you would like to combine with your own, um, but they are not in RDF in the first place. Another way of getting access to data on the web is via APIs that are provided by uh, many, uh, some, uh, many web uh, applications and many web uh, tools as well. So for example, the Open Movie Database or Facebook. And uh, Rinke has provided a very nice uh, I, uh, Jupyter notebook. If you follow this link, you will uh, see get to his GitHub uh, page. Let me show you. And there you get the Semantic Web Assignment 4 example. So that was already in last year, uh, slightly earlier. And it's about data integration and it's a notebook. And what you simply can do is to copy the code. Uh, and what, they, uh, what it shows you this code is how to get access to uh, the OMDB uh, API and uh, later also on the Facebook API. What you have to do is to uh, import a package which is called request and then you give it the address that uh, you want to query and you give the parameters and in this case this is information about the movie Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. And you want the plot in a short format, you want to re response data in JSON and so forth. Then you send the request given your parameters and the, the address, and you print the response. And this the re result that you get uh, is uh, a JSON, which is a JavaScript object notation, and it contains all the information that uh, is also in the database. Um, as you can see, it's not very neat. It, it contains some things that are very useful. So you get the rating, and then you have a, a clear rating. But you also have things that are um, in, in lists. So here, for example, you have the writers uh, list, which has uh, first uh, uh, an object and then in parentheses uh, what these people did. So screenplay and so forth. So the, it's difficult uh, to, to use this directly. Uh, so you need some transformations. Um, but first, let's create a, an RDF graph and then define a namespace and a binding. So things that you have done in the first uh, uh, two weeks. Um, and you create basically a new object, uh, uh, a new namespace for this. Uh, and now we can add some information, uh, triples from this JSON file and add it to our knowledge graph. And in many cases, this is simply, sim simply uh, um, what kind of uh, type is the thing that we add. So they are simply one statement translating one uh, of the elements of the JSON into one triple. But there is also some loops that you have to do over all the actors, if there are several over all the jaws. Um, so just check this document out. It's, a, I think, a very good overview over how to get from a JSON document to an IDF document. So this is then what you get if you do a serialization of the graph that you have just created in Turtle. You get the same information that we had before in JSON we have now in RDF. And then we do the same with Facebook. So um, you need to, uh, to get a user ID, you need some access token that you have to, 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 uh, to ask uh, Facebook to give you. You give the address and then you send again the request with the parameters that you had and the URL and you get a JSON object back. Here is a JSON object again, was about the same uh, movie. Um, 
and then you get a response back from Facebook, which is again JSON. It's a different JSON, so you need a different procedure to translate your JSON into RDF. So first we build a new graph, a Facebook graph, and then we print the, the name of the graph and we add things from the JSON to this new graph. Let's see how this looks. So this is the information that we now got from Facebook. So we have some movies with the names and so forth. And then the next thing is, of course, to put these two things together. So we just build a new graph, which contains the graph from the movie database and the Facebook graph, and we serialize it. And then we see that we have IMDB information first in triples, and then we have Facebook information in triples. So this is how you get from the databases to RDF. And now obviously the question is, how can we now integrate these data sets once we have them both in knowledge graphs? So this is the question now, how can we now integrate this data? Um, because as you, as you might have seen in, the, in this example, in the RDF, we have one namespace uh, Facebook and one way of representing the, the knowledge. We have one namespace uh, IMDB with its own representation of the world. And now the question is, how can we derive the integrated knowledge for these two things? And I gave a similar example sometime before. So the question is, how can we retrieve the actors from the movies I like on Facebook? So. This was the translation we just, uh, this is the information from the API that we just saw in, in JSON from Facebook. This is the information that we see from IMDB. And this is how this was, the, the Facebook was converted into RDF. And this is how the IMDB is converted to RDF. This is exactly what we've seen uh, just in the, in, uh, some minutes ago in this example that, uh, uh, that Rinke made. And now we have the combination of the two. So we added the Facebook graph to the IMDB graph and get a new graph. And now this should become something very powerful. We have IMDB, we have Facebook, but at the moment, this is still two separate data sets. But now that we have them in knowledge graph formats with possibility to adding background knowledge, we can uh, now integrate them in a very elegant way. So how does this, uh, this integration works? So um, again, this is given in the, in also on the, 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 the GitHub page from Rinke. So you can uh, see this data and you can follow it. Uh, so here is the example that we have a Facebook uh, object, a user, and uh, that he or she likes some IMDB object. This is the, the first way to integrate, namely that we use explicitly objects from the other database uh, in, by making explicit links between objects from one database to another one. So that's something you can, for example, do relatively easily, but it, it requires the work that you really need to understand what each of those objects mean. Here's another example. So we have, uh, um, say that there is a match between two objects. So for example, Scott's exact match between the IMDB object that denotes this movie um, and the Facebook object that denotes this movie. And then we can use the information from IMDB, who the actors are uh, via some complex query. So here the, 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 the data integration has to be done in the query because now you write a query, give me all the actors who play in a movie for which there is an exact match to some movie in the IMDB, where this object in the IMDB database has an actor, and then you return the actors. So this is data integration via um, matching of the vocabulary, the thing that we talked about in the previous uh, video lecture, and matching of the, um, and, 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 and following this, uh, the, the links then uh, via a Sparkle query. So we have basically now integrated two data sets into one golden data set that we can ask complex queries to. But we can do more because we have now semantics and we have formal meaning to given to our, our, our operators in the language. And uh, let's see how this works. So we have um, this database of a, a Facebook user and he likes two movies. 
the movies have names, namely Walking Life and Zeitgeist. And the one is a Facebook movie and the other one is a Facebook community. And um, the, the one has a movie label and the other one has a community label. So if I now ask for in a Sparkle query, give me all the titles of something that is a movie because it is in an RDF type movie re uh, relation with the concept uh, Facebook movie, uh, then I will get Waking Life because the, the movie Zeitgeist is not labeled as a movie, but it's labeled as a community. So now if we add the information that there is this way of labeling movies in Facebook where we say communities can be movies, then we can add this on a, on a, on a higher level, on a, on a conceptual level, on a vocabulary level and say everything that's a Facebook community must also be a Facebook movie. And once we do that, we get two results because now the community, uh, the, the, the second movie with the nine zeitgeist, because it's a community, it also, sorry, it also becomes a movie and therefore it is also returned in our Sparkle query. So using some knowledge, we have successfully enriched the data set of uh, Facebook or the RDF version of this Facebook because we now have linked the community concept with the movie concept via a subclass of mapping relation. Here is similar a similar example of the usage of, uh, of uh, same as, of, of expressive knowledge. So we have, uh, in this simple example, we have a user who likes a certain movie, and this is information we get from Facebook, and we have a movie with actors. Uh, and if you ask the query, give me all the Facebook users with the movies they like, they like and the actors that they like, um, or the actors that play in this movie, then you will not get any answer because the movie in Facebook and the movie in IMDb, they are obviously not linked. So our query doesn't know that they are the same. So what can you do? You can add an explicit uh, mapping relation, same as. You can say that the movie in Facebook is the same as the movie in IMDb. And when you do that and you ask the same query, then you will get now a table back with the actors in your uh, information in IMDb. So this is very useful, but it actually means that you need for all two movies that are the same, you need an explicit axiom that says these two movies are the same. And this is rather difficult or painful to do. But what we can do, which is also very nice and powerful, if we have the names of the movies in both IMDb and Facebook, then we can use the inverse functional property and a generic axiom of two axioms about the property name and the property title to make sure that everything with the same name in Facebook and IMDb is mapped to each other and is, is therefore has, becomes the same object. So how does it work here? We have a Facebook user who likes a movie. We have a movie with a certain name. We have um, um, IMDb um, information about the title and the actor. And the only thing we need to say is that the name and the title property, so name in Facebook, and the title in IMDb, that they are equivalent properties. For that, we use one axiom, Facebook name is our equivalent property, IMDb title. So now that basically means that these two things are the same. And now when we state that name is an inverse functional property, then this basically means that everything, if, if I have two objects with the same name, then they have to be the same object. So remember the example that I gave in one of the lectures before about the, the mother. So if I say two people are my mother, my, my biological mother, then this basically means that these two people have to be the same person because I only have, there can only be one mother. And here it's the same. If I say that name is inverse functional, then it basically means if two movies have the same name, they become the same object. So in the moment I do this, 
um, I get the full result as if these two objects are dp uh, tto12 and so forth is exactly the same as the movie in Facebook. The big advantage is now that I do not have to specify this per movie, but this is one piece of generic knowledge that I have modeled in OWL that now maps everything in Facebook and everything in, um, in IMDB with the same name. And this is obviously very powerful because now I only really need these two statements instead of writing this for every object individually. There is a price, by the way, I have to, I want to go back here. This only works if the name is really exactly the same. So it, it, it doesn't work perfectly well. So if we had um, a spelling error, then these two things would not be the same. If we had Las Vegas in one word here and he, not here, then it would be two different things. So it really works only if the, the, the object of these triples is precisely the same. So if this one wouldn't have the, the English tag, then these two things would not be matched. It only works when you have exactly the same things. So that's why you need in practice, if you really want to do this on a larger scale, you really want more intelligent matching algorithms where you would say, okay, if there is one spelling error, these things would, would probably still be the same. But for the sake of this exercise and for also your application, this might be a very good way to map things and to make sure that they are considered to be exactly the same. So the last thing we have to discuss and think about is how do we then get access to this uh, knowledge that we have now integrated uh, with either um, uh, expressive OWL statements or at least some kind of mapping where we can query over. And that is how do we get from the data that is now in our repository to uh, a data publishing. And there are different ways of doing this. Um, we will use the Sparkle language to get uh, access to this information. Um, so remember, we have the, the data uh, that we have transformed into RDF. Either it was already in RDF, uh, if we query DBpedia, for example, or by Sparkle, or we have transformed it uh, from CSVs, or we have transformed it from APIs from the web. We have all integrated it in our own database, in our Stardog, um, and we added knowledge to really not only have, have the data in one place, but also to really integrate it. And this integrated knowledge is now easily queried by Sparkle, which you have done in, in week three, and so that you should be familiar with. Um, the question is now, how do we do this in practice? There are three different models. The one is uh, that um, we make a copy from the data sources and load everything in our application server in the reasoner in our Stardog. And then the user, which is the client in, in this case, queries our Stardog directly. It has a big advantage that the application does not depend on the data sources at query time. So when I want to know, get information from uh, IMDB, I do not have to ask a query to IMDB because uh, all the information is already in my intelligent knowledge base in the middle. Uh, and I only have to ask my own Stardog uh, to give it the information that it has. That has a big advantage that it, it is independent of the online time of IMDB, for example, because you know that sometimes DBpedia, for example, is slower or even doesn't work, and, and other data sources is, is even far worse. But uh, it has a disadvantage, of course, that the application has to store all the data. So you need to uh, have a pretty big, uh, big uh, machine and, and, and memory to, and I believe that your uh, data stores, the Stardock uh, data stores that you have installed has a limit. So you need to make choices of which kind of data do you want to show in your application and which one you don't. So you can't load the full DBpedia in your data set because then your system will die. 
Uh, and it means that the application cannot query dynamically. So if uh, there is a new movie coming and your data hasn't uh, been updated, then your, your user, your client will never find this new movie. So that is uh, something that works for some things, but doesn't work for others. So if you want uh, uh, to write a program that does uh, news, of course, you want to update it every minute. So if there is a, uh, a new development in a political uh, development, then you, you really want it, this to be online and dynamically uh, taking account of the changes. So that doesn't work in this sense. There is an, uh, an alternative, though, that you can uh, use the reasoner as intermedi interme intermediary. So uh, the, um, the reasoner is queried by a client, sends then the a request to the original data sets, gets the results back, does the transformation and the knowledge integration and returns the result. So the application needs to store some data, but it can dynamically query the changing data. So if, the, if there is a new movie, you will be sure that it was returned in this step three. Um, but this dependency is also a problem, as I said before. So if your application is down, if, sorry, if the data source is down, it doesn't produce any results, you cannot do much about it. And then the reasoner, the data integration on the fly cannot help because it doesn't get the data. There's also disadvantage that you need the transformation from, for example, the Facebook JSON object to the RDF data, if you use it on, on, the, on the fly, then you need to do this transformation step each time you have a query, uh, and that uh, might take more time than you wish. The technical way of doing this is um, uh, if you want to avoid this transformation from data um, uh, into RDF, if you know that information is already given in some Sparkle endpoint, you can use a service query. And that basically is within a, a query that you ask as a client to your knowledge base that you can say, I select something, for example, of a class fourth person, but then you, you also want to query something that's outside this endpoint itself. And then basically you use a service query, which just gives you the endpoint in which to find the information uh, and it sends out an uh, HTTP request to this endpoint to get the data that you want. But this has obviously the, the, the big problem that if this service endpoint is down or is slow, that your query itself has to wait until you get the results. So for truly um, dynamic applications, this can really become a bottleneck. And then there is uh, the possibility of trying to do something in the middle. So you have a, a, the, the, the make partial use of the reasoner. Um, so you, you ask questions to the reasoner to get, for example, information about the, the, the data model and, um, and, the, and the, the reasoning itself. But uh, uh, then you get uh, asked the query directly to the data sources and you get the data back. This data is then not, not necessarily in the semantic web format. So the application itself needs to do quite a lot of reasoning and data, and it depends at query time on the external sources. So there isn't um, one of the three solutions that is clearly better in all the cases. So you really have to make a decision of what kind of data do I have, what kind of access to the data sources, data sets do I have? Is a transformation once, once and for all in the beginning the right thing to do? And this is a tricky decision to be made, a tricky decision for you, particularly because you have this restricted uh, uh, space in your repository, so you can't have the full data set if you want to build an application that uh, queries that goes about all the movies in IMDb. You might have a problem when you want to load it all in your in your uh, knowledge uh, in, in in your triple store. So you might want uh, to a solution like this one, where you do the transformation in a programmatic way on client side. So this is is really one of the decisions that you have to do each time you build an application 
what is the right model for for using the knowledge and the reasoning if I want to build an application on client side. So these were the three models. You can use the reasoner as a database where you put everything in your database. You can have the reasoner as an intermediary where you query your data sets via the reasoner. Uh, for example, service queries, or you first get some knowledge out of your reasoner and then you query the data sets directly. All three of them are perfectly valid solutions, but um, uh, needed for different purposes. So the final thing is maybe not so critical, important for this course, because uh, um, we want you to build an application and not so much focus on the republication of data. But in many cases, you build a very rich knowledge and data set that is really cool to, for other people to use. So it's all about data publishing and republishing again. The one thing you, um, we now have is, of course, that we have our data, we have it integrated in a reasoner, we have a, a, a knowledge that we use to integrate for this integration, and we have Sparkle as our language of access to this data. And now the question is, what do we do with the data? And we can build an application, but we can also publish it on a website. We can publish it as a total file for people to download. We can publish it as web services. And there are different options for doing this. So the one thing we probably do is uh, integrate it in our applications. And um, that is, it can be very useful, but it means that it's not the data itself, the one that you produce with your data integration and your knowledge is not programmatically accessible. That's not necessarily a problem, but it sort of it, it de deprives people from uh, using your nice data set. So one thing you can do is you can um, publish it uh, and expose it via some kind of your ID referencing. So there are tools for this, probably a browser virtuoso. And this is really web-based because you, you put your data and someone knows where the data is. They can ask queries and they get via describe algorithm, they get information back about your objects that you have created in your data. So that's uh, one way of doing it. If you are interested of republishing your data, look at these tools, Pubby, browser, but you also how this is done. Um, an alternative is to, to use it, uh, to, to publish your data as a, as a REST API. And um, there, there are many ways of doing this. So there's a linked data platform, linked data API, garlic, and it has limited expressiveness. It doesn't return RDF in many cases. Uh, but it can still be very useful. The final thing is, uh, is a, is a cost, costly option, uh, and this is uh, exposing your data via Sparkle Endpoint. Basically, you have a database running on your laptop, um, and if you open it up, everybody could use your data. Problem is that, um, obviously, when you close your laptop, your data is gone, so you would have to host it somewhere, you have to make sure that the database is, is online all the time if other people want to, to use your data. Um, and it can be very costly because you don't know who's going to use your data. So DBpedia really needs a very sustainable, very big server so that it can provide the information all the time around the clock to all the people who, who need it. Um, so that is really something you have to think about before you do this. Disadvantage is that it is not, ne not necessarily returns RDF. You can also get tables or JSON and so forth. But luckily we know how to transform these things back or how to do, um, how to even get RDF back uh, from triple stores. So to summarize what we do in data integration now with the formalisms that we have studied the last four or five weeks, we use RDF as our format of choice of our uh, knowledge graph representation language on the web. And uh, we transform external information into RDF because this is really a, a useful format for building um, a richer scheme, an integrated scheme and integrated data. We try to maintain the original scheme as much as possible and use inference and derive mappings wherever that is possible. So this was the example, for example, of the, the uh, inverse functional property of the movie. So when they have the same name, then they are supposed to be the same things. 
Um, for the app, we need to think of the best architecture. In many cases, I would suggest use uh, your Stardog as the, the, the database approach where you put all, your, all the information that's relevant for your application into your Stardog. But uh, in many cases, it might also be useful to, to directly uh, use the, the Facebook API and do the data integration on the fly. So this is really your choice when you build your application. And then it might be nice to publish your data using one of the available tools that I've just talked about and that are worth looking into. And basically, the idea is that you take data that is OK, you take another data set that's OK, and by integrating this, you turn this into a far richer golden data set. So class will give an introduction to the final application right now as the next video lecture. Um, what is important is that you really do more with Sparkle because the service queries, for example, is something very important and um, you really need to, uh, to, to, for an app, you really need to know exactly how to get, use Sparkle now to get the information out of the, the data base out of my Stardog. But before that, of course, you need to see how do I do my own, how do I make my own linked data? How do I define an ontology over this data set? And then how can I integrate my own data with the one of others? And in the end, it's all about publishing the data on the linked uh, link data on the web and particularly building a nice semantic web application in the final project. Mm -hmm.